Hello, mediums, and I am not where I need to be for the intro. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Here we are, weaving words and spinning tales so readers the world over can join us for the ride. Because writing isn't just about outlines, edits, and deadlines, the dreaded deadline. It's a craft, a craft that is its own special art form. On this episode of Writer's Journey, we've beamed in Tara Allred, I hope I pronounced that correctly, to chat about the craft as an art. She's going to break down the five elements of story, help us think through our story's central conflict, and explain how we can get the most out of our setting. So let's jump into it. Tara, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yay. Great to be here. What an intro. Wow. This is fantastic. <laughs> That's what we know. It's what we do. And Rick Partlow, golf clap of appreciation for his comment in the live chat. Thank you for being here. Corey Gilliam, Ken Britz, y'all, we are here and we're going to talk craft. And Lauren, what have you been up to? We, I mean, we're two weeks now coming in with shows. So you've got lots of updates to. Oh update. man, I am living the dream. I'm editing for Galaxy's Edge and it's like book after book after book. A lot of the authors I'm working with, they've been writing for some time. So they're kind of growing on their author's journey. And then I also get to see some of Nick and Jason's writing and that when I edit that stuff, it's like drinking caffeine. It's just so exciting to edit. I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. You know, here's something, here's something, but oh, this is so much fun. So I'm having a great time. I love those edits where you forget that you're supposed to be editing and you're just like, all right, I need to reread the beginning of this chapter because there probably were some things, but I just got so into the characters, the yes. story. Laughing at funny. the computer screen as I'm like, oh, this is so, this is so good. Nice. So we're crying too, because it's Nick, Nick Cole, and you know what he does with his character sometimes. Yeah. Mm. It's a, it's a deadly necessity mm. or sadness. I don't know. Um, that's that's been about what I'm doing. Um, editing frenzy, um, you know, hanging out, hanging out with the willow. Yes. And my mom's doing better. She's she's getting up, walking around, actually going to the store and stuff. So she's not, you know, Good. bedridden anymore. So that's really happy about that. Uh, yeah, Tara, how's well, the, how's your world look? That's funny. You guys bring this up. I just got my edits back from the next book in my series. I've been working with my editor and taking in all the feedback. And I have to say, when the editor comes out of their editorial mindset and shares a comment that's story-based, it's really hard to delete it. You know, when they say, oh, that made me laugh. And that was so funny. You're just like, oh, I love this. Like, I can't delete this comment. So I've been having fun dealing with the edits on my end. Nice. Yeah, yeah, we have word docs, us editors, Kayleen, Ellen Campbell, and I, we keep a word doc of nice things customers, authors say, you know, for our edits and just kind of copy and paste them. And then when we're having a down day, we'll go back and check it out. Um, so, yeah, if there's like a comment from an editor that makes you happy, keep it. <laughs> uh, oh, I have to say, my most recent favorite one mm. is the author said my edits were beautiful. And I'm like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> So it's like it's it's bleeding and dying, and they're like, it was beautiful. And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> all those red marks all over it. <laughs> so yeah, with that, the story elements. Mm. Um, what are these basic elements of storytelling? And you know, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw it all out there for you. Mm. You know, how do we lose sight of them? You know, why are they important? That whole spiel. Well as editors, you guys will be able to relate to this right away because it's not anything really magical, although how you use them and what you do with them is where the magic comes from. So getting back to the basics, all stories have five elements in them. If you don't have one of these elements, you don't have a story. So very simple at first. And a lot of times, sometimes uh, writers don't realize how getting back to the basics is often where your story might be off. Um, so let's just talk about the basics for a moment, and then we'll go a little bit deeper on what you can do with them. So the five elements are character. You can't have a story if there's not character. Uh, then it's plot sequence. So I like to think of plot sequence like a dot, and then another dot makes a line. So a story is a whole bunch of dots, and it's how we string them together. Um, and then we have setting, which we're going to talk more about. Um, setting is so important. And I once in college tried to write a story where I thought I'd be super clever and vague about my 
setting and that didn't go over very well. The teacher was like, this sounds like it's an outer space. We have no idea where this is. Like you got to give us something. So I learned right away, you can't cheat on setting. So we'll talk more about that as well. And then conflict, um, each of those points in that line, if you want to have a scene, there needs to be some conflict, some type of tension, something going on, whether it's internal or external. So conflict's the fourth one. And then the last one, and this is where I love to talk to writers because you can always kind of see what stage of their story process is based off of how they understand this, but it's theme. And so mm -hmm. without theme, and we're not going to talk a whole lot about theme, so I'm just going to delve a little bit into theme if you don't mind, just for a moment. Oh, yeah. Just go for go, it. Yeah, yeah theme, for it. We, we talk a lot about conflict, character, and setting, but theme is one that kind of gets forgotten because we're like, oh, we're not doing literary. We're doing like, I don't know, fun space opera, you know, we're, we're doing just fun stories to consume. But if there is that main idea kind of running through that the whole story, it can tie things together and give you surprising ideas you might not have come up with it. So I'm really glad we're getting into this. And I love that, Lauren, that was beautiful because what I always tell writers when they're writing that first draft is oftentimes they don't know what the theme is and it's okay. Like you're not supposed to, it's more of this discovery that's happening. And so as a writer, that first draft is your opportunity to find what the story is. So at you, as you reach the end, you're like, oh, there's kind of this echoing that's happening. There's, there's something that's resonating here. There's something that went a little bit deeper into my conscience, my soul here that's kind of coming out in the story. That's when the beauty happens when you go back and do your revisions as a writer and you start to say, okay, if I'm a little more intentional, and that's going to be my key buzzword through this whole um, session is intentional. And so when a writer goes back and does the revisions, if they're more, if they're mindful of what that theme is, this is where they can raise the bar of their story. And to your point, Lauren, I just, to me, a theme is what makes the story matter. Like what makes it stand out that's different than the other story that they read the other day? Like what makes it uniquely the writers, but also what makes it universal. So the reader can somehow connect, even if they've never been to outer space, even if they've never interacted with aliens, even if there's something that, you know, they've never had, we've all dealt with fear. We've all dealt with love. We've all dealt with anger. You know, these are emotions that if we bring into the story and have a theme that can resonate with the reader, no matter what our setting or our characters are, that's where I think a lot of the magic ends up happening. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, a lot of times I see when definitely when people are starting in on that new, that new manuscript, they focus on too many things all at once. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can't answer every question right from the get go. Um, so yeah, God, my brain just died. But if you have one, if you've got <laughs> you one main idea, yep. then it, that might be tied to how your main character is changing throughout the story. Mm -hmm. So if you get stuck in a conflict or a plot point and you're like, I don't know where to go from here. I don't know what's supposed to happen. You could go back to that theme, go back to the idea your character is kind of wrestling with, and it might give you a new idea. Exactly. And when you go back and do your edits, you kind of want to strengthen it a little bit, right? So like mm -hmm. if like, and I mean, this is a very trope theme, but like love conquers all, okay? So then you've got a situation where either you're going to make love the triumph in that scene, or you're going to make it maybe actually a downfall. Like maybe it's actually um, stripping the the character of their power in that particular moment. And so it's just how you're going to use it. But I truly believe you can't do that at the beginning. I appreciate that, Kayleen, that you said that. Yeah, that's that's going to stifle the writing in the early beginnings. But later, there's so much power in being able to revise and be mindful of what your reader's experience is going to be. And those won't come out until after you first discover the story. So that's where I take this next is how to discover that for you as a writer. Um, so can I, I want to talk about, because you had made a comment on how we lose sight of these, like what happens so that we lose sight of these five elements, because they're, they're what a story is. It's just when we first start out, you probably have heard this. I, it's one of my favorite quotes that are out there and I should give the right attributions to who said it. But the first time you're writing a draft, you as the writer are discovering the story. And then after it's for the reader to discover the story. So there's two different stories really happening. It's me as the writer, what is this about? And however you choose to write, whether you're a plotter or a pants, pantser, 
and I believe most of us are somewhere there. It's, we're not like a strong one or the other. There's, there's somewhere on the spectrum that we are. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, even as Josh, Mr. Josh Hayes says, you know, when you're outlining, you're still panting, you're panting the outline. You're, just, yeah, you're exactly. laying down all the ideas, all the, I call it vomit. You're just getting all the vomit out and then mm. you can start siphoning through it and be like, that's a gross bit. And this is a treasure, you know, find that's out the pieces. Beautiful. Yes. I'm going to have to listen to John. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yes, exactly. And so it's funny when you get people who are like, I'm absolutely this, or I'm absolutely that, or I won't do this, or I won't do that. I'm like, I think you're only kind of hurting yourself because there's value in both of them. But the point is you're discovering your story. So whatever you have to do to discover it, if that means you're going to write some scenes that quickly come to your mind, you've got characters talking or you're seeing things and you got to write it down, do it. Like, don't say, well, I can't because first I have to have this set up. And also same thing, you know, if you're like, I've got this outline and I've got to follow this outline, even though the character's screaming to do something different, I'm going to be true to my outline. You're stifling yourself. So when you're in that creative stage, First off, the funnest thing about that first draft is giving yourself total freedom. There's no wrong. There's nothing that you have to hold yourself to. Just create and have fun. And that takes a lot of the pressure off, I think, for some writers who just are afraid that they don't know where it's going to go or they're afraid they're going to mess up. And so it's like, give yourself total freedom. You have permission to uncover a story that doesn't exist. No one else has written it. Nobody else knows it. For whatever reason, the muses have given it to you and you get to experience it first. So it's really this powerful, fun thing to go into that mindset of this is mine and I get to find it first. And then if it goes well, then you're like, this is the coolest thing. Like mm -hmm. I have got to have somebody else hear this. Like, <laughs> I can't hold this finally to myself. Magic. <laughs> what was that? And so you finally, you finally hit that magic. Like you just, you have the, you, you might have an idea in your head and you're just throwing everything on the page and then at some point everything clicks and then you know you go back to the beginning you bring yourself back to that point and it's yeah it's okay to change the outline it's okay to um change a character like i halfway through a story once completely changed a character um and had to go back to the beginning and rewrite him because he was no longer that person anymore so i needed him to be different in the beginning you know all of that is okay and yeah will make for a stronger story if you give yourself the permission to to mess up to be bad and just vomit just I like that. <laughs> permission that is yes. those okay yes exactly permission and so so after you do that and I, I mean this is in my mind once you hit that the magic like you said it's like where you've drawn a picture and you want to go show it to your mom to put as a little kid and for her to put on the fridge you know you're just so proud of this and like the truth is it's probably not as polished, but in your mind, you've just encountered this amazing story and you're like, oh my goodness, who gets to put this on their fridge? Like, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, I just want you to see how like this happens and this happens. And that's when you get to go back to the drawing board. We do a reset and now we're writing the story for the reader. We're being very strategic and back to my word, intentional on what is happening with the characters, what's happening with the plot, the setting, the conflict and the theme. And so those five elements First off, they should never slow you down when you're in the first creation time because you're just creating like, I don't exactly know this character, but I can't wait to get to know him better. I can't wait mm. for this. Like, that's how it should be. I can't wait. But when we're looking for the reader's experience, we're a little bit wiser and we want to give them an experience. And so mm. now it's like, okay, how do we manipulate? Because reading is really an emotional journey. And us authors get this awesome opportunity to manipulate emotions. It's it's approved. Like, it's, it's not approved anywhere else. But as a writer, you are okay <laughs> to manipulate emotions. <laughs> so as a reader, you want to be thinking, okay, where yeah, exactly? So when do we want them to have the horror and not terror? And when do we want them to be break down with crying because something really sentimental or awful has happened? Yeah, when are we looking for those kind of emotions that we're looking to? That we're trying to take them on. So let's so, go through each of those five elements. What are we looking for uh, to have that emotional impact for the reader and to, to help them to follow along our story the best? Okay. And this is, I'm glad you brought this up because I, when I work with writers, I have like activities for them to do. And it's so fun and also sad when I see these writers think that they, they have to do the assignment to the T. Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. Here's the thing all I'm asking is you are the creator of that character. And so if you don't know that character, how do you expect the reader to have this amazing 
experience with the re with the character. So I give these assignments so that they will go a little bit deeper. So I'm trying to challenge them. I'm not saying you don't really know your character or your character has to fit the box I'm creating. No, 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 no. There's no box I'm trying to create for you. I want you as the writer to know enough about your story that then the reader will be like, oh, I bet, you know, I bet, I bet there's, so, so I'm going to give you an example. Okay. So one of the things I do is I, um, I have, it's 110 questions that the writer needs to interview their main character, their point of view character. And they're, yeah, exactly. And this is <laughs> and a lot of times some writers kind of kick back or they resist. And the, what's funny is <laughs> it's not the questions that are important. It's the character's voice that starts to emerge. It's the tone. It's the attitude. It's the, so I love it when the writer comes back to me and they're like, oh, these don't fit my character. I'm like, I know they don't fit your character. I want you to help me hear the character say, why are you asking me this? This doesn't even fit. This isn't my life. This isn't, you know, well, okay. Like, so here's an example. This is a really dumb one, but I want you to get a vision of what I'm trying to help the writers do. There's one that says, do you carry floss in your purse? Okay. We're asking your character if they carry floss in the purse. What's wrong with this question? First off, we're making an assumption they carry a purse, okay? And then we're also carrying an assumption that floss exists. Exi yeah, <laughs> or they exactly. have teeth. <laughs> exactly. So the easiest thing for a writer to do is come back and say, this doesn't apply, right? That's the easiest. What I'm looking for is, hey, what do you carry? If you don't carry a purse, that's totally acceptable. What are you carrying instead? You don't use floss? Great. What do you use instead? If I had a caveman that came back to me and said, well, first I get this stick and then I whittle it down and I whittle it and whittle it, whittle it until I get this little toothpick. And then I go and I like start jarring. Do you see the level of detail that's starting to come and the tone that's coming and the attitude that's there? That's what we're looking for. So if I ask that same question to each one of us, we're going to have a different response because it's a different character. It's a different experience. I could care less about the floss or the purse. I don't expect either one of them to show up in your story. What I'm expecting is you're going to get this attitude and this tone and this voice, and that's going to carry through your whole story. And um, just one little thing, because I, I love it when a writer gets stuck. And the reason why I even came up with this was because of my own experience. I mean, these five elements didn't happen for me until I had three books under my belt. And I mean, of course, the five elements have existed that's what a story is, but just identifying and being like, okay, this is what it's about. Um, so I got to present to a creative writing, a high school creative writing class, and I shared this with them. And then one of them came up to me, you know, the next time I came, she's like, I was so stuck. And then once I interviewed my character, like, it's like the dam broke, you know, I just, I had all this stuff that was flooding me and all this information. And that's like, that's what we're going for. We're trying to dig a little bit deeper and it's going to be uncomfortable because it's like, here's my safe spot with my character. And now you're making me go deeper. And at first you're like, I don't know. I'm scared. I don't know that character that well. And I'm like, yeah. that's mm -hmm. the point. That's yeah. exactly the point. You know, in something like that, because there's one thing definitely that I see um, more so in newer authors, because, you know, they're still developing their own craft, their own voice and all the things, you know, the floodgates um, is when when they're writing these scenes, all the characters end up sounding like cardboard cutouts. Mm -hmm. You know, they all, they all sound the same. And that is on a level of, they all have the same reaction. So with that uh, floss question, you know, your character is an 80 year old granny who has 20 grandchildren. Oh yeah, sweetie. Did you, you know what? I also have a lollipop of make sure. Yes, of course. I always care the floss. Da, 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 da. Or you have some like gargantuan tentacle monster. And it's like, what is this floss you speak of? I will destroy it, you know, or whatever. And just those sorts of, of ways that we speak can make your character that much deeper. You know, like yeah. one edit I made recently was I changed, um, the, the opening of the sentence from um, it was like so or something, something really common. And I, I changed it to lad and I put a comment on it because I'm changing the, the character itself's voice a little bit. I'm like, this just feels like this character would be like a lad kind of, kind of a guy. He just gives me this, you know, Oh, what's going on laddie and things, you know, and those tiny little, little blips are what will set your different characters apart if you allow yourself to feel, dig into their own emotion and body language and things like that. And I love that those questions are so completely random because it does, it will force you to be like, okay, well, how would my giant tentacle monster react to some dude coming up? Do you carry floss? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. That's good.
Ken Brett's points out, there's a big difference between the writer voice and the character voice. Yeah. Yeah. And I've noticed that uh, when authors, new authors, you know, written a little bit, their side characters start to take on really interesting personalities. And some of them can be a little stereotypical, um, but that's, they can be fun in that way. But then still the main character might be this, uh, this every man that they're kind of expecting um, the reader, like any reader to be able to put themselves in. But then if you make that every man character, you're like, but I don't know who this person is. They seem like an empty box. So that's where these interview questions might help you to start putting things into the box, like personality and experience and background and scars, you know, um, talents, gifts, um, fears, goals. You know, you start putting those things in the box and then you have that to draw from and, and a voice can start forming as you interview and talk to them. I guess that would be the hope, right? Exactly. I love what you both shared and Ken, what, what you shared as well. Exactly. It's it's trying to find all of this in those questions. Um, and, Loss of doom. <laughs> um, and finding them in, in the answers. But also what I think this helps with too, is we all know the, the saying, um, show don't tell. And it's, and like often when I go into a book, I know what I want the character to do, or I want the character to, uh, handle a situation a certain way, or it's very easy for me to get into the telling. But when I go through these questions, especially because they are surfacey, there are those like getting to know you just small talk type things, but that's not the point. The point is, how do I show that I really don't like this person? How do I show that I'm going to be resistant when I get in a situation that makes me uncomfortable? And so it's fun to see, okay, in everyday situations, where are we actually seeing their personality creep in? And anyway. Yeah. Speaking about being uncomfortable. Everyone's it's the night in the box, Ken says. <laughs> exactly. And um, on on that note, um, you know, these these five. Oh, wait, we wanted to go through each one individually. Are we still doing that? I don't know. Because yeah. I was oh, I was going to. I kind of go go ahead. Either way, which way do you want to go? <laughs> well, I was just like on on that note, because like a lot of authors, you know, they have this idea. It's like I'm going to do these space marines or I'm going to have this. Um, fairy tale retelling, you know, and, but, you know, everyone's done a retelling of Cinderella, you know, everyone's, you know, had Marines go into, you know, some base on an asteroid and, you know, extract something or blow something up, you know, so if we're all using the same elements, you know, how can we still create something new with them? It's a deep question. No, it's a great question. <laughs> um, so so as I was putting this, as as I was thinking on these things, so what's really interesting is it's not like character to plot or character to setting or character to conflict. It's a web, like all five of these intertwine and they're a web. And so if you're a mathematician, you know, the more variables you have and the more ways that you have to calculate things, the more abstract and the more it starts to mold into something totally different. Does that make sense? And there, every character, if we, so back to that floss question, and I'm not trying to like overkill it, but if we ask every no, single just be our, It'll be our ground. Yeah, it'll be our go-to. I, I hope that you carry the floss beyond yes. the session. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if we take that floss question, we're going to hear a different voice. Like, Kayleen, I loved the grandma that you gave us. Like, that was awesome. <laughs> that was just like right there, you know, and each person's going to have a different voice that's going to come. Even if we box them in a little bit more and we said, okay, they have to be 80 and they have to be this and they have to be this we still would see someone's variation on that. And the same with the plot. Okay, um, sometimes plots become very trite, like you're saying, you know, like we kind of have that go-to retelling and it's all the same. But if we twist it a little bit and the motives are different or the conflicts happen a little bit different, the tension's different. So we still have Cinderella and we still have the glass slipper and she still loses the glass slipper. But if the conflict, the tension is, they were killing my feet and I actually mm -hmm. liked to run really fast and they were cramping my style and actually they didn't slip off. I chucked them into the forest and I didn't want them to begin with, you know, like that's a different thing that her tension was the uncomfortableness, not the, Oh, I was trying and this happened. And, you know, so it's just, how do we take all these elements and shift them for the purpose of our story? And going back to, again, that first draft, when you as the writer experience it and you're like, this is the coolest thing ever. Now I want to share it with my reader it's being very strategic and intentional so that they have that experience where they're like, well, this is something new. This is something unique. Um, 
I I remember when I was in school and they said, oh, well, all the plots have always, they've all been taken care of in the Bible and Shakespeare's taken care of all of them, you know? And so it's like, you can't invent anything new. And it was like, I had mixed feelings on that. At first I was like, are you sure? And then I was like, well, that kind of takes the pressure off a writer, right? Like they already, <laughs> just, like, you can't do anything new. It's already there, but it's how you tell it. It's your unique voice. It's coming back to theme. Um, your experiences in life are totally different than somebody else's, but we're all humans. We all have some type of challenge that we can relate to with each other. So if we tap into that, then it's like, wow, you get me. Like, I love that when a writer's or a reader's like, you get me. And it's like, well, no, I just said, I deal with fear. So I'm going to write a book where I try and work through my fear through these characters. And you work with fear and you connected with fear through my book. Like, this is really cool. This is how we connect. Um, so I don't know. I, I could go on and on about well, that. Well, on, on everything that you're saying, what I, for me, what's resonating for me with what you're um, describing is it's not the plot. The plot could be anything. It's your characters and it's the world with which they live in and how that affects them. And we say this a lot on Keystroke. I know Josh says it a lot. Scott says it a lot. If, if you don't have characters that aren't resonating in some way, making a, a reader angry or, you know, making a reader cheer for them or, or, you know, feel for them, want to jump into the book and slaughter, you know, all the hordes of orcs coming at them, um, then you're doing the story a disservice. You're doing the plot a disservice. Mm -hmm. So if you can stack your deck with diving in deeper with your characters and then wrapping them up into the setting, you know, your plot could be Cinderella, but it will be your Cinderella. And that's where there will always be an endless uniqueness to grasp. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And um, to add to that, because I like, I would always say I'm like more character driven in my novels. Like I, you can obviously hear my voice that I'm very passionate about your characters. But then I'm like, well, I've also read books where the plot's really been lacking. And so it's this, it's, you can't sacrifice one versus the other in a certain way. It's, it's really, that's why these five elements are so important. Because if you're like, something's lacking in my story, that's when you could take a step back and say, do I feel like my characters are strong? Usually, because I believe in the character power so much, usually that's where things are limited, you know, because if you get your character and they really start to come alive, then right to your point, Kayleen, you put them in a situation. And I like to say those plots, you know, if you're doing a linear um, story, which you don't have to, but most of us do, is then it's like, okay, to this point, to this point, to this point. And my character is now defined enough that I can put them in that point, which is the scene. And there's going to be that tension. We know how they're going to respond based off of who they are in the situation. And if our goal, so I think, I feel like with plot sequence, it's kind of a goal. Like, okay, now I want to get my character to this goal. Now I want to get the character to this goal. So you know how you want the story to end more or less, or the characters kind of help to guide you in that endeavor. So it's like, okay, how do I get this character to this place? Oh, well, maybe I need to change the setting a little bit. Maybe I need to change the conflict a little bit. Maybe the plot was going this direction. Maybe I need to veer it just a little bit this way. I'm going to drop my plots a little bit more of this by my points, um, but it's still going to get me to my end point. Does that make sense? My, my full line. Um, so I think if you have a strong character, they're going to help. It's, it's a partnership basically. And they're going to help with your journey. Um, but you might find that your plot can be mixed up a little, you know, I mean, I think we all know the, the funny Cinderella stories where she doesn't want Prince Charming, you know, those type of things where it's like, okay, we think it's this way, but then it twists a little bit. Those are fun too. Anyway, I'm just going on and on about it, but there's, I really think this is like such a key part of being a writer is just knowing your elements, um, working at your craft enough so you start to say, ooh, this is where we're lacking a little bit. Um, in fact, can we talk about setting and conflict? Since so yeah, I, was, just, I was just going to say, I'm going to read the um, the show sponsor really, or the spotlight, spotlight. really quick. Um, but I really want to dig into after the spotlight, the using the setting as a character, because that is like out of the whole discussion that's the one part that i was really the most excited about because we hear so much about the characters we hear so mm -hmm. much about the plot but setting becomes this sort of ambiguous thing and it's like well they're in a castle 
that's my setting, you know? So I'd like, I really want to dig into that and especially that concept of it becoming its own character. Mm -hmm. So with that little hook to the next half of the show, this week's spotlight is on Beyond the End, book one of the Existence series by Tara C. Alred. Nothing else exists. At least that's what she's been told. Strong-willed teenager Leilani Grady is suffocating on her family's island. She wants off, but her parents say the rest of Earth is destroyed. When a stranger shows up, Leilani realizes her parents have fed her a life of lies. Asher Harmon shares a complicated history with her parents, and now he wants Leilani's help to, with saving his society. It's her chance to escape. <coughs> Sorry. It's her chance to escape the only place she knows, but Leilani must decide who she trusts, her flesh and blood, or this man who promises to fulfill her dream of doom because we always have doom, 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 doom. Yeah. all right and did i oh i forgot to get a link i will get a link while we are jumping into setting excuse Boy. me Wally. No, thank you Tara. i noticed with your blurb that kayleen just read you've got the five elements there you've got character you've got the basic conflict you you've touched on the setting um, you touched on the theme. It's kind of all there. Uh, we had another guest on before, Dave Chesson, and he recommended to authors who are trying to figure out what their story is to write the blurb before, even before they write the outline, to figure out what the main idea of the story is and kind of flesh out, flesh out that blurb, like a movie trailer for your book, and then use that to kind of guide your plot. What, what do you think of that idea? I, that's funny you bring that up because I have a friend who um, she was in the uh, news industry before and she was a producer. So she would have to write these short blurbs, if that makes sense, to really captivate you and grab you. And I said, you need to go into the book industry like you you really. And so we've had a lot of great conversations. She actually helped me with that one. And we um, it's been fun. And we've talked about getting some writers who are still working on their books and doing this, this exact thing. Um, for me as a writer, I think big and to hone it down to go small is like that's the worst part of the whole project in a it's way so hard. <laughs> so hard. Um, but I think you're right if you can really get that and have that vision that's powerful that's great I find that probably my story would change and shift here and there from conception to that final product so I would probably have to go back and tweak stuff but you should always be thinking how am I going to be selling this what is the captivating pull that's going to draw people in and and book descriptions more than anything speak to emotion so often in my early days my book descriptions were very much like let me tell you the plot this happens <laughs> and this happens and now don't you want to read it and people are like no and so no that was a great story thanks for sharing it <laughs> <laughs> exactly why do i need to <laughs> um, so the book description is really how do you pull that emotion in and for me I like an emotional journey if I'm going to read a book. So when that book description from another writer speaks to me, that's where I purchase it. That's where I'm going to buy it. Um, so to your point, yeah, I think if you kind of know, here's the tone and the emotion I want to bring, and I know enough, by all means, write it out. It'll make your life easier after you've written your 70,000 word <laughs> book. <laughs> And if you are one of the one of the many authors, myself included, that um, writes the blurb after you finish the book, by that point, you know the theme. So if you know the theme, you can wrap mm. your blurb around that. And then the you know potential reader is going to be like, oh, I need more of that in my life. And then mm -hmm. clicky click. Like we all want. We all want all the clicks. <laughs> that was beautifully said. That was really well said. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Totally. Um, well, this was fun that you read that because it ties in perfectly with setting. And um, had I not done previous books, I wouldn't have been ready because setting is so important. Um, and so early on, I started to realize you create your tone through your setting, like that's key. And so if you want a mood, if you want to create fear, you put them into darkness. But if you also want this very tranquil, very soft, very um, soul moment, darkness is often there as well. Does that make sense? Same with rain. Rain can be almost romantic and very 
cute and cuddly, or it can be this horrible, destructive plan in your day. And so what I love to do is say, okay, what is my goal for the scene? Where's the tension coming from? And how can the weather, how can the setting, how can we bring more into this moment and create even more? And I love, metaphors are my thing. Like I do have this love for literary writing with metaphors. And so for me, the setting is just this plethora of places to start pulling your metaphors from. So if you want, you know, to have an ant farm below you, and I shouldn't use this, I do use it in my writing all the time, but I love to say, okay, let's watch the ants and what can this parallel and what's happening in the real story scene or the wind or the clouds, you know, I mean, those are just things where it's like, okay, can I create a metaphor that even heightens what's really happening for the storyline? Yeah, I went back and read the Scarlet Letter and I was just struck by how much the, the sun and the clouds and the trees and everything reflect the mood of the characters in the scene. It's it's like, it's cinematic in the way the author mm -hmm. pulls it out. Uh, but Ken mentions uh, setting as character works well for the Martian and the island on Lost, that, that, that nature itself plays a character in the story. That's very interesting. How, how does this happen? Okay, that's, and I love, okay, so with Beyond the End, it's same, same idea and perfect examples, by the way, of both The Martian and um, Lost. Those were spot on. I mean, Lost, that island was as important as the other characters. So yeah, how this works is you, <laughs> you need to know your setting. Just like I've been saying, you need to know your character, you have to know your setting and you have to have somewhat of an intimate relationship with that setting because it's going to be more than just a nice little thing to pull from as you go along. It needs to be there. Uh, I really encourage writers after they've written that first draft, after they've done the discovery, then go back to each scene and you want to tap into your five senses. And it is amazing the difference in the writing that happens. So the first writing is just like, okay, they're there. And this is what happens because we're always like, okay, story, what happens, what happens, what happens? So that's usually they have that in the first draft, but what they don't have is what are they smelling? And why does that smell play into what's really happening? Um, so you got dead bodies. You better be smelling something that's going to make it uncomfortable. And you usually are going to be smelling something first before you see it. So your order of things is going to be really important. So be mindful. Okay, what is the character experiencing when? So are they touching something first? Are they smelling something first? Are they seeing something first? Um, taste is always a harder one to get in there. But I'll tell you when it's done well and not forced, it's really powerful. Um, and then, um, of course, audio, too, is going to be one that they might hear well before they see something. Um, something fun to think about with smells is smells are one of our more powerful senses. And smells can take us back in time very quickly, um, which is fun because as a writer, if you follow, you know, self-editing for fiction writers or, you know, some of these other classics, they're like... Um, don't do flashbacks. You know, flashbacks tend to be a novice experience that a novice will try and put in flashbacks right away. And the reason why I'm anti-flashback, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but especially if you're a new writer, you've got your plot and you're trying to build it this way, but then we go, pause, let's throw a flashback in, you know, <laughs> like all this momentum that the reader's feeling. And it's like, ah, oh, you just stopped me. Like I have to now go and read about something. Anyway, but if you want still to have that character have a moment that takes them back, we're still present in our scene. We haven't stopped the tension, but I can have a smell that's just like, oh, that's my grandma's bread. Oh, that's mm -hmm. safety to me. Like I smell homemade bread and that means safety to me, which is a great counter if they're in a place where they're not feeling safe. Does that make sense? So the smells yeah, can goes. tap into the reader's emotions. Yes. Yeah. Memories. Yes. I, that reminds me a specific edit I did. I don't even remember. It was a while back, but... It was like two pages and they're in the middle of this conversation, this heated like debate. And then all of a sudden one of the characters is like, oh, going back on this other thing that happened at another time. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm like highlight these two pages. I'm like, okay, either move this and make it its own scene before this happens or shrink it to maybe a paragraph or less. I'm like, I'm like, Two, three sentences. That's all we need. If you're going to, if you really need to have that moment of, of he's thinking back to just like, it needs to be like, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Well, no, said. I agree. well said. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, oh, I did. Um, I think I've mentioned this before. I love pulling in nature, um, uh, temperatures, 
oh. into uh, getting that mood setting. So there was like the opening of a short story I did um, where I was describing um, the snow, how that, how it was, you know, kind of is crystallizing on the character's um, beard and he, mm -hmm. it was really irritating. And then everyone else around him is just sort of like slugging along. They don't really seem to care or notice the snow and that irritates him even more. Mm -hmm. So it was like the, which brought us, you know, into, I wanted to have that tension, that like frustrated, confused anger going into the initial scene. And that was how I painted that was um, through the snow. The characters made sense. <laughs> reacting against yeah. the environment, which is playing a role as another character um, right there in that moment. Yeah. That's um, beautiful, yeah. by the way. Just well done. <laughs> What about making the making nature come alive and take on its own personality? Because we do have a lot of sci-fi authors who are on um, alien planets and they're creating a planet mm -hmm. and um, their space marines might be fighting that planet. And uh, this could be historical romance. This could be a whole lot of different genres. Horror, oh my goodness, horror, where the setting is actually coming alive and might have malevolence, you know, and, and taking on a personality, anthropomorphized. How do you do that? So one of the things, and this is in, in my current series, the existent series, um, which Beyond the End is the one that you just read about, um, there's a huge love to their home. There's a huge investment to their home. There's, there's anything that happens. Um, so a lot of it, there is a little bit of, I do love science fiction and I pull from like um, earth science and like, I'm, I'm pulling from like the traditional sciences and then I'm putting it into my story and so there's a lot around earth conservation and like what we've done to earth that's hurt our planet earth and so bringing some of that to life like okay if we see earth as part of us and we do something to earth we hurt as well and so you've got this planet that's suffering and the characters are paying for that they're they're hurting too and I any science fiction writer especially if you're going outside of earth there's going to be some type of feeling and emotion towards that planet. I mean, there whether it's destruction or whether it's life, it's 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 really beautiful when you realize. And I'm going now into science, but how we can't coexist without nature and without our environment, and that we are part of the ecosystem. And so you disrupt that ecosystem, and you put yourself in jeopardy as well. And so playing on that in your writing is really really powerful. So because we want our readers to feel the emotions that our characters are feeling, our characters should be hurting when their setting or their planet's hurting and they should be rejoicing when nature's blooming and, and when we're in a beautiful setting and we're seeing animals thrive and the ecosystem continue to develop because that's what we all want. Like a beautiful setting is something that can coexist in harmony. A bad setting is when we have conflict that's destroying our setting. And that's that's really a very simple statement, but we want to be feeling that. And just one thing to, to add to both of your comments. Um, so I talked about the time invested to interview your character, to really get to know your character. Well, I do this myself. And when I shortcut, I pay for it. But each scene, I want to go back to that scene and I want to interview that setting. And I want to take a moment and say, okay, what is happening in this scene? Not just with the characters as they're interacting, but in the environment we're in, whether it's outside or inside, what is really transpiring? I mean, if do you have a fan that's that's blowing up ahead, you know, like does that rustle papers? Maybe that belongs in the story, maybe it doesn't. But it does really help too when you have dialogue and exchanges happening with other characters. If you just know what's going on in your surroundings, then you can easily move something and it doesn't even have to disrupt the flow of the story. Those are the funnest when you're just mm -hmm. reading and it's just flowing, flowing, flowing. But we have just enough moving in the environment around us that we as the reader are set with you. We're, we're feeling the character's experiences at the same time the character is. Yeah, that um, as it can be as simple as there was one, um, uh, one of my authors did, the character was like flicking. It was, he was playing with the mm -hmm. edge of a piece of paper, right? And he's nervous. There's all these monsters and stuff gonna come and kill everybody. And then one of the characters, as she's, you know, just talking, she's very level-headed, you know, she's kind of like the mom figure of the whole group. And she just takes this candlestick and very pointedly, you know, 
drops it on the thing and then just continues about her conversation. But like, you just feel this like rising tension because she kind of glances to it a couple times and then just takes this candle holder and slaps it on the corner of the paper. And you know, it, it, there, it wasn't like a long winded thing. It was just like the characters are sort of like, ah, and then she continues on about that, that moment, but you, it paints a much deeper and richer setting it, you know mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. see the characters where they're at you see the table and the little bits and you know you don't have to go in and paint every rock like the colors of the wind for ten thousand pages it can mm -hmm. just be just that quick um, yeah a sentence or two just to remind the reader where we're at what it looks like what's going on and and also you're talking about the character dynamic and with their environment you know there's a candlestick here there's paper there maybe we're in some kind of a library or um, a study where this is happening um, but yeah, I, I find with um, a lot of new authors that dialogue can be easy, can be easy to write. You get the characters' voices and the voices just start talking and the words are flowing and you're just typing away. Um, but then when you get the draft done, you're like, oh, that's a lot of quotation marks because a lot of my manuscript is, is conversation because it was just easy to write. Um, but then, so where do I start when I go back into the drafting process? Where do I start to figure out what's missing here? Um, and kind of balance that out. And it's often setting. It's often like the visual description of the setting or it bringing those senses in, um, bringing in the characters interacting with the setting, like, you know, Keeling, you're saying. Um, and uh, what also theme, because we've got, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, oh, so um, another one that we could kind of pop, talk about and discuss is how to bring in that theme once you've started noticing that there is a reoccurring idea uh, how do you how do you draw that out and um, color color it and highlight it in your in your writing okay this is a great question I absolutely love it so once we know um, and then we've got you know all this action that's going on in our scene because we want action that's important but it's where we kind of pause, where we put an emphasis or it's a word choice. That's what's really fun too. So, I mean, I'm, I'm picking very general ones just so we can all relate, but like if, if love or friendship is, let's do friendship. So friendship is one, you know, and you can have your phrase of what your theme is with friendship, but then we're going to take a moment so that we've got a dialogue, we've got lots happening. There might be, you know, some growing tension maybe between these two friends, but friendship is what's going to win out. So we take a moment to pause in all that ex energy and we, have the main character maybe looking at the friend and just having a moment to just internal dialogue or whatever it fits, or maybe it's, even, or this isn't that important or just something where they just say, okay, you know, somewhere in the scene, I just need a moment just to, and it doesn't have to be much. It's a phrase. It's just something, but as we just very strategically and intentionally place it in certain places, then it, it brings that whole story together and, and it puts a more solid. And that's, what's always fun to me is when I read other, writers works and you can tell the ones who have went back and spent a little bit more time with their manuscript and done this versus the one who don't and then you're like three-fourths in and you see where they were going with it and you're like oh all you had to do was just go back and do a little bit more intentional planning to just kind of bring it all together and i feel like that's what theme is it just kind of wraps it up puts the bow on it says hey reader as the author i put some thought here i was intentional this is my gift to you. This is my theme of, you know, what friendship really matters. And, and you're going to see this with our characters as they interact and as they work together. Um, and so that's, I don't know if that answers it, Lauren, but that was just kind of where I was taking it is, yeah, just go back through and see just few word choices here and there. Be, um, if friendship is your theme and then suddenly you have them hating each other and you all you hear, feel is that hatred, then it's harder to believe later when it's like, but I would do anything for you just because I pretty much stabbed you in the back. You know, it's like, wait, I didn't feel that. Um, so yeah, just being mindful. Um, and then um, just because I want to touch on conflict a little bit, uh, tension can be found in our setting as well. And um, even our character and our setting, they can have some conflict within themselves. You know, we all know, or you should be familiar with the different types of conflict that are there, you know, uh, character in nature, character supernatural, character with other character, um, there's thought character in technology. Um, so they kind of have those umbrellas. But one of the things I give writers an opportunity to do is brainstorm and put a timer, so five minutes for each of those big buckets, and then just as, as much as you can, like what are some possible 
setting conflicts your character can have? Why, why can they hate their environment or love their environment? Or, you know, like what's going on? And just brainstorm, because then I think that plot sequence that from one line to one line to one line, we might say, okay, I thought this was where there was some good tension, but I can raise the stakes even higher. Or there's even an opportunity to have two or three things coming in that really help shake the boat and like have our character have to dive even deeper to get out of this mess. Or And, and I don't even just mean like, we're going to die. Every scene should not be, we're going to die. <laughs> um, but we can have our own internal, I'm going to die because I have to face this fear. I'm going to die because I have to actually talk to this person who I hate or, you know, like whatever, or I love or whatever, you know, so just finding ways that we can ramp up the stakes, drive a little bit more tension. Um, and we're almost out of time, but can I talk about opposites for just a moment? Yes, so, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Cause this is, I always like to say, this is my like secret weapon. Um, Ooh. But I know now I'm going to share it with you guys. And so it's not too secret anymore. But uh, and it, this is the secret weapon, I think. So when I was in college, I took a Bible as literature class and I loved it. So not spiritual, not history, just literature, like why the Bible is you know, still read and talked about all the time. And one of the classic things that changed my whole approach to writing was we all know, especially if you're familiar with Joseph and the Technical color dream coat you know all we all know that joseph and potiphar's wife we know that story but what we don't know is in the bible how it's set up is the chapter before that is one of his brothers being very risque and very having a very different attitude towards um how he was going to be with some woman anyway so the point is is these two contrasts were so huge that what happens is not just one stands out, but you have the opposites. And so it makes each one stand out more. And so that juxtaposition was like revolutionary for me. And so each time I take a manuscript, it's like, okay, I want to show hatred. Well, then I've got to show love. So the closer mm -hmm. we put those, not necessarily in the same scene or with the same characters, but we want to look for how we drive one versus the other and how we can have those opposites played out as close to possible to really stretch the variation. So light and dark, um, love and hate, um, fear and courage. Anyway, so anytime you can put those opposites together, it actually makes them stand out stronger. Mm. Uh, and the challenge then I think for writers is sometimes it's very easy to have hatred very easy to put in violence. It's very easy to put in um, negativity things. It's the positives that sometimes are the harder ones because you don't want it to sound trite. You don't want mm -hmm. it to be snarky. You don't want to like be forcing it. So I find the positive emotions are much harder to craft well than the negative ones. Isn't yeah. that sad? It's like, it's like all things in life. It's just so easy. You know, it's like, like a teacher writing on the board, one plus one, two plus two. And then like at the very last one, 10 plus 10, they put 21. The, crap, the, all, the whole class laughs at them, snickering. Oh, the teacher got it wrong. And the teacher's just like, yeah, but I got nine of them correct. And you're just focusing on the one thing I did wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Not just teaching, it's writing too. You write a book and the reviewers, they see the one thing you did wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. there's, the, there's the one test. Mm -hmm. Eight the test. So if my theme is friendship, then, and I'm still coming up with my plot, still coming up with my characters. I'm like, what's missing here? Well, what's the opposite of friendship? And like, what breaks down friendship? And what, what kind of characters would be the opposite of that? Um, what kind of situations would be the opposite of that? So you might have your main character and then you come up with a foil. You come up with a character who's like their evil doppelganger, their evil twin kind of thing, or just a different variation on them. Um, or that can help you look at jealousy or revenge or self-centeredness or whatever it is. Um, and you're right. Those characters can be easy to write. <laughs> And the fun ones. <laughs> I do. You can, you can, you can even do um, that with 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 other pairings because that made me think. Um, like, what if you had like a really bubbly, super happy character? They very rarely get down, and they're like in the middle of a horror story. Mm. And but they're just like, and we want some gumdrops, and there's just like you know this zombie coming around, you know. But <laughs> but what's gonna challenge that character? What what could make even that character fall? What See, but like, yeah, and then and now you have your conflict. Now you have you have you're getting into you know the character's growth and why is this bubbly, super happy 
you know, the anime character driving around in, you know, zombie land, handing out lollipops. I don't know. Like, yeah. And this is back to how do we keep our unique voice? Because we all would have different endings. Isn't that, isn't that mm -hmm. so cool? Like, I love it. I, I do workshops with, um, with schools and it's so fun to see how we get to a point and I say, okay, now all of you would write a different ending. Because like that, yeah, what would happen to that happy person? Would they rise above it or would they become like the others? And is there a right or wrong? It, so fun, so fun. Exactly, yeah, you could turn into some weird romance. She falls in love with the <laughs> with the zombie, I don't know. You know, it, it could be a you know, rise against all, all odds. You know, she comes out a little stronger, but she's still the same. You know, she goes through a moment of, of complete devastation, you know, a little gets a little dark maybe she i don't know earns evil powers i don't know lots of lots of options um but yeah definitely knowing those five story elements keeping them in mind giving yourself the permission to just play with it you know just put all the colors out in front of you when you're when you have that blank page stick all your fingers in the colors and then just finger paint like a crazy one year old who can just splatter paint everywhere, get it all out, vomit it, and then go back and be like, I like that line. Mm -hmm. And then you, you can start molding it and pulling the pieces out, you get a fresh sheet. You know, you start laying down your, your constructs and, you know, and like you're saying, Tara, the, the intention of um, what you're trying to find, you know, you're trying to build that love story. You're trying to build that, um, you know, the, the weak kid rives above all, you know, whatever your theme that you find after you've laid down all the colors. Um, and yeah, I could do, wow. I could do a lot. I could do that a lot for a lot of stories. I can tell you that much. Heck yeah. I loved how you said that. Yeah. Because when we first go to paint, just paint, just go have fun, like put all this off to the side and just go at it. But then you're right. Then it's being selective and saying, Ooh, that's really pretty here. Oh, I like this. And sometimes you find that your story went a different direction and then you decide, what do I actually want to tell? What is the real story I'm trying to tell here? Hmm. Exactly. Hmm. All right, Lauren, any last words, moments, comments, questions you're dying to get answered? Um, no, I just, I'm going to take that opposites as the secret weapon um, home, you know, and uh, think about my story and think about uh, what's missing and how to, how to get it up to the next level and, and opposites might be the key. I don't know. I don't know. Oh uh, yeah. Brain, brain blast. Uh, some people, they're just like, it just feels flat. My scene feels flat. Why, why is my story just, maybe you're missing the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, every, all, all the whole thing's a giant wash of gray, you know, throw in that slap of bright white, red, you know, whatever the opposite is for you at the time. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that's what you're missing. It's my oh, secret what? weapon. Works for me. So uh, more power to everyone who tries it and see if it works. I think it's great. <laughs> so. All right. Well, y'all heard it here. Tyra, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom, digging deep on, well, story. We love talking about it, the craft of it. Um, hopefully for our viewers out there, you got a few little nuggets that you can take into your own works and really bring out those characters, really bring out your settings. Um, really bring out all of those bits. And with that, we do still have going on our flash fiction. We are getting in our last judgment uh, tallies. And then hopefully in the next couple weeks, we can get that over to Tony Weiskopf. Tony Weiskopf. Tony Bane uh, Books. Three. Yep. And then she will pick the ultimate winner. And yeah, uh, again, we won't be back next Friday. We will be back the Friday after. Do we have, do we have a... Jeff Haskell will be talking genre. about jumping into a new genre, getting into a new genre. And he'll be talking about his new launch with Athon Books, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. So, all righty. Thank you much for joining us out there in the land of all the things of where you are. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, ding the little bell, so you can get all the notifications. And with that, I am Kaylee Williams for Lauren Moore. Be sure to check us out the week after next on The Writer's Journey. We're going to talk about reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Peace out, you guys.